Okay. So <laughs> let's get to know each other, Patricia. I'm very excited. Oh, me too. Uh, can't wait. Can you tell me like how you got into motorsport and, and how long you've been riding and what was that like the moment you knew like this was going to be your future? Um, so my background's untraditional. I don't come from a racing family of any kind. I was a kid and asked my parents for a dirt bike and they told me I had to move out of the house. <laughs> I wanted to learn to ride motorcycles. So I did. That's the first loan I ever got was a used motorcycle loan. I just, I don't know where it comes from. I just thought motorcycles were so cool, you know? And so, um, I was 25 before I ever did my first track day. I had to save up my money and everything. And, uh, yeah, I just saved up my money and did a track day. I eBayed like leathers and boots and everything it was else. And it was just so cool to go fast and not have cops or deer or gravel or anything else like that. <laughs> and I just absolutely loved it. I remember the first time I touched my D now and I got scared. I was like, what is that? <laughs> you know, I didn't know. I didn't know I was destined for it, but I just, I loved it. So I just kept doing it and I kept doing it and I kept doing it. And I just like, within a few months I was bumped up and I remember I did my mock race to get my club license and start racing amateur won a bunch of championships start racing expert won a bunch of championships and then I remember the first pro race I qualified for was in 2012 and I remember I was crying so I was like I don't belong here what am I doing you know <laughs> I just didn't know and I qualified and did it and then ever since 2013 I've been a full pro so I think it's just one of those things like if you would have asked me 15 years ago, if I would have been a pro racer, I would have said no. 10 years ago, five years ago, it wasn't something I ever necessarily planned, but doors opened and I just kept taking the path. Like I just loved motorcycles. Nothing made me feel more confident, more amazing, more awesome. And I just kept going down the path. So that's kind of, kind of how it went with it. So, you know, it's opportunities keep coming and I keep going through it and I'm going to do it as long as I can. That's amazing. I think that says a lot to your character, too. You're afraid of nothing. You're going to go for it. Well, no, that's not true. We're afraid <laughs> a lot. But I think, like, the fear of not trying is worse than the fear of trying, I guess. Like, okay. I always tell people, I'll ride anything. I'll go anywhere and race. I don't know if I'll be good, but I'm going to try. You know, people think we're fearless, but a lot of motorcycle racers, we do have fear. But you, that's why you calculate it and you practice. And you do drills and you go through so much to, you know, you don't start out going 200 mile an hour. It's something you build up to. So I definitely think it's just something we have to train ourselves to. But I definitely get scared. <laughs> that's, definitely, that's true, especially rain races or overseas races. But uh, I'd rather get through that fear than the fear of not trying. That makes sense. What would be your scariest moment you've had on the bike? Going further on that. Um, so... Some of the first scary moments, definitely, I compete in the real road races overseas, um, proper road racing, as they say, in Northern oh, Ireland and stuff, like yeah. the Northwest 200 and Ulster and stuff. I remember the first time doing those, like, in the pouring rain, on the roads, with fans there, just thinking, like, this is absolutely crazy. You know, the first time I raced Armoy, it's called the Race of Legends, and it was raining, and both of my wheels came off the ground, like, full-on moto jump. That's oh what they God. do, and you... Yeah, and I was just like, oh, my gosh, and you are just committed. And you probably jumped two or three times in a lap there. And it's one of those things I am I knew about it, but I'm glad I never felt it before because I don't even ride moto on dirt bikes. <laughs> but you just, you just commit. You got to go. You can't back out of it. But that was pretty terrifying. There's a really awesome photo, though, on the cool down lap. And I'm one-handed, just one hand on the throttle, and I'm waving to people, and both wheels are off the ground. I'm doing a jump in the rain. So mm -hmm. that's one of my favorites. But uh, when I had to race a bagger in the rain for the first time was kind of a scary feeling all over again because I didn't know what that was going to be like. But those bikes handle surprisingly well. Yeah, talking about the baggers, they're an incredible bike. The series is absolutely astonishing. For us in Europe, we don't run anything like that. And we'd really love to see, we'd really love to see something like that come over. What's the, what's the motivation for the bagger from you? Well, I actually, my husband raced a bagger. He was at the inaugural one in 2020. And they were looking for another rider and they had thought of me and I was like, there's no way I never even rode one of those bikes on the street. Like they're a thousand pounds on the street bike, you know? So, you know, a 700 pound one on the race track, 640 pounds is a lightweight bagger, which is crazy, you know? And they were like, come and try it. And I was like, I don't think I could ride one of these things. There's no way I can't even touch. And so my husband was 
really supportive. He's like, how about you try? And I'm always that person. Like I said, I'm willing to try. I was like, all right, I'll try. We'll see what happens. You know, it's, I'm pretty short stature and everything. And I was like, I'll give it a go. And the first time I got on it, just lap after lap, I was knocking like two, three seconds off. Like, I mean, obviously I started out really slow. I couldn't believe how well they handled. I had to have four people come in and catch me because I was screaming. I couldn't stop because my feet were dangling in the air. So the scariest part was trying to stop it, actually not get it to go. But it's just, you know, he was racing it and they believed in me. And they're like, there's no female that's ever did it. You'd be the first female to ever do it. And I was like, oh, okay, that's going to be kind of cool. Now I got to do it. Yeah, now I got to do it. And so I'm the only female that's ever raced one. And to be honest, they're not easy to ride. They're gigantic bikes. And most of the people on the grid have experience of some kind of super bike of some kind to be able to ride them well. So there's not too many women that had that. So I did it. And it's insane, like, how many women I met. I think they're badass, like riding them on the street, you know, and they would come up to me and just thought it was so cool to have a girl in it, you know, have a pony in the race, as they say. And so that's why I just kept doing it. Like, I thought it was awesome. And it was so new and a different side of the industry. And even the last three years I've been racing them, every time I'd go overseas, the number one question I got in Europe was about bagger racing. And it was so funny. Everyone wanted me to race a bagger on the roads. I was like, there's no way I'm racing <laughs> a bagger on the roads. But, um, the popularity is insane here in America. I mean, it's just, I can't think of anything more American than racing a bagger, you know, but uh, we're actually going to get to ride with MotoGP this year in April at uh, Coda in Austin, Texas. We're going to be the exhibition race now. So the bagger races are getting more views on the superbike races and more attendance. So I think it's just cool to bring something new to the motorcycle industry that hasn't been around. That is really cool. Um, I have to ask you a more woman-based questions. What are the reactions of the men when you're like flying by them? I guess they have a helmet it's, on, so you can't quite tell, but I'm just interested to know, like, how does that feel? And how do you it, think they react? It's definitely mixed. For me, I love it. So a lot of times when we do track days and stuff, I'll point the camera backwards because I love getting the men's reaction. Yeah. Because you see them get physically so mad and I'm like, ha ha ha, you know, the only thing worse than getting passed by a bagger is getting passed by a woman on a bagger and they hate it. But to be fair, I would get those reactions no matter what bike I started riding when I started yeah. getting fast. They absolutely hated it. And the more they visually got upset, the more joy they brought me. And I don't think they realized that. But um, from men, it's a mixed reaction and honestly from the beginning of when I started racing to now it still feels like there's a mixed reaction there's a certain amount of men I feel like think like you're just gonna go away they kind of ignore you there's a certain amount of men that absolutely love it because a lot of men now have daughters and yeah. they make they treat their daughters just like they do boys like I couldn't tell you how many racers I race against that bring their daughters for me to sign autographs and for me to meet that. And I think that's really cool. It's just like, it's a not a big respect thing. And then obviously there's still a portion that absolutely hate it. Their ego can't handle it and they can't stand it or anything. But to me, the more they get upset, it's just, it brings me so much joy. It's so much more of a motivator. And, you know, even from 13 years ago to now, there's so many more women in it. And now there's the women series with FIM and everything. And you just see more and more women not just in this country, but I have the privilege of racing in other countries, seeing them out there because, you know, 20, 30 years ago, if you had a girl, you didn't treat her the same as you did a boy. But now guys are having girl girls and they're just, all right, let's go ride motorcycles and do everything that dad does. And I think it's just absolutely really cool to see more and more women out there doing it. And I see all these young women that are going to surpass me in so many talent ways. And I think it's so cool just to be there and be a part of it and see it. If you could give like some advice to some girl out there who's really like not found the motivation to like get out and get on the bike, but you know, like she wants to do it. Like, could you give some advice in that regard? Well, the thing I always tell women is like, you just can't take no for an answer. And that really doesn't matter if it's at the racetrack or anywhere. There's a lot of women in male dominated industries, like corporations and, and just certain businesses all around that have been male dominated for a long time. I think the one thing that women lack is confidence. But the thing is about confidence, you're not just born with it. You know, confidence is just like a skill on the motorbike. You have to practice it and you have to grow it. And I don't, you don't know if you're capable of something until you try it. And then you try it. You're like, man, I can do that. And that's how you build your confidence. 
And I think there's so many women out there that are capable of greatness and great things. They just lack the confidence to go out there and try. And so I just always tell women, like, never take no for an answer. I couldn't tell you how many times I've been told no. I couldn't do something. I wasn't going to be successful. Like, literally every moment of since of the last, like, 14 years that I've been riding, it still continues that people say stuff like that. And I just don't listen to them. I listen to my own heart. But it takes a lot of courage and a lot of confidence. But confidence is a skill. You, you know, people think, you know, I, I get a lot of compliments like, you know, oh, you don't have fear. Oh, you're just so confident. You're born with it. No, I wasn't. I couldn't tell you how many times I've cried on a racetrack, on a professional grid at a racetrack that I cried. Like, what am I doing here? You know, but like I said, I pushed myself past that and I tried because the fear of not knowing, I'd rather try and fail than never know what it'd feel like to try, you know? And I think that's something more women need to harness their energy because there's so many incredible women out there that are capable of so many great things. You just got to give them a little bit of a push. So if women could just know that they could train that confidence as much as they could any other skill, they'd just be capable of great things. That's really interesting. I like what you said about also the the no thing. Do you think the the constant no's are also somehow like a motivation to you? I know like for me, if somebody tells me no or like says, I don't think you know enough about this or that or kind of gives me negative feedback, like that fuels my fire and I'm like ready to go after that. I'm like, I dare you to tell me no. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. You can ask my husband what I act like when he tells me no. (laughs) I'm definitely, I'm a woman and I'm a Latina, so I don't like that word. I say I'm allergic to no, but to me, it's a very powerful motivator. And at the same time, I'm a big reader. I read a lot of books and I read a lot of books about most of the time making yourself a better person, mentally, physically, you know, emotionally, all kinds of stuff. And I've read a lot where you should listen to that inner voice. We all have that inner doubt, like, oh, I don't know if you're capable, but oh, you might fail. But if anything, you should listen to it and create that negativity as a best friend. So like if I'm, I get real nervous public speaking or when people want me to do, you know, speeches in front of women or things like that, I'm like, "Uh, I'd, I'd rather have a helmet on, you know, but I think about, okay why am I nervous? I'm nervous because I'm worried I might mess up or I'm nervous I might do this. So then I'm like, okay, I need to practice. Like you kind of, I kind of take that negativity and I make it my best friend. I make it my motivation. So the same thing like, oh, you know, you might fail at this race. Say I'm going overseas to a racetrack I've never been at. You're right. I might fail. Why might I fail? Because I don't know that racetrack as good as the locals. So what do I need to do? I need to get on a video game and I need to start practicing. I need to get track maps. I need to call locals, you know, To me, you got to take that negativity and turn it into your best friend and befriend it. So many people take that negativity and they let it, you know, like drown them or push them away where like really you can use that as a tool. You just got to learn how to do that. And it takes practice, you know, but you just got to learn how to like, like I said, if you're scared of something, like, why are you scared of it? What can you do to prepare for that? How do you change that? So that's kind of, so yes, you make that negativity a motivator. I love that. You like lean into it. That's good. Yeah. Going forward onto the racing and women particularly, um, there's become the new championship called the FIM Women's Championship that's come about recently. And they're going to be race, racing the Yamaha R7, I believe. Um, there's a lot of talk about their spotlighting women to this, but then there's a lot of talk about actually them putting them in the spotlight is what's needed to be the thing to happen. What's your opinion on that one? So I honestly have a split opinion on it. Um, I I'm for it and I am against it. Um, to me, one of the most beautiful things about motorcycle racing is it's one of the only sports left in the world. That's not sex divided, you Mm -hmm. know, soccer or football or swimming or anything else for the right reasons. There's a men's class and there's a women's class. Motorcycle racing is one of the few platforms men and women can compete on an even playing field. And to me, that's been what's so rewarding. You know, it doesn't matter if you're man or woman doesn't matter if you're German or American, rich or poor, when it comes down to racing, a good racer is a good racer. And I think that's one of the most beautiful parts of the sport. So I've always loved, like, even to this day, you know, I will get people that are like, oh, you must compete against women. When I tell them I'm a professional racer, I'm like, no, I compete against men, you know? And so it, I mean, still to this day, they're widely throughout the world. It's hard for people to imagine women competing against men. Um, So I think that's part of what's so beautiful, you know, at the same time, I understand taking all women and putting them in a separate class to put a spotlight on them to try to grow it. But is that going to grow women 
in sports or is it just going to go rem- grow women in one class? So I'm kind of, I kind of have mixed feelings about it. I mean, we have an American in it. Go Mallory. I'm excited for her. She's a good friend of mine. Woo. Um, Yeah, but I, you know, so it's kind of, I see it both ways. I'm glad they're trying to do something for women more so, but part of me is sad that they're separating them and not putting them with everyone else. So that's a tough question. I, I, I'm on both sides of the spectrum of that one. Do you think that falls under that kind of like girl boss category where it's like, yeah, but I'm just a boss. I'm not just a girl boss. Like, is that kind of the, the split there? I know because part of the, I don't know, part of me, one of the most rewarding feelings I've ever had is knowing that I've been on the same playing field as a man. Does that make sense? Like I've proven myself, you know, when I explain to people, when I have to qualify, yeah, when I have to qualify to pro race, I don't get extra time because I'm women. I don't get extra privileges or special, whatever. I am under the exact same rules and regulations as every man on that grid. And if I prove myself under FIM, Moto America, AMA, whatever it is, standards, I deserve to be there. No one can tell me anything different. And it's a beautiful feeling. It, it, it's just amazing. One of the only sports left in the world, you could say that. And yeah. so it's tough for me because you want equality in the sport. But then when you separate women and give them their own class, does that make it equal? And there's some incredibly talented women like Anna Carrasco's in it. She won a World Super Sport 300 championship against yeah. men. So she's incredible. Like, I mean, absolutely incredible. There's really talented women in there. I almost just wish they would have done something where maybe they did their own class and then maybe the top 10 girls got to compete with the men at World Supersport or something like that. Do you know what I mean? Where however they did it, I just wish they would do it and then also still mix it because I just don't want it to be separated because I don't believe there's enough women yet in the world to run a successful women's series everywhere, yeah. you know, so taking them all and putting them in one. I mean, I see, I see the both sides of it. So it just tough. Cause when they did announce it, one of the questions I remember watching um, the press announcement when they released it, they never consulted any female racers when they discussed the series. That sounds pretty so simple. Yeah. So if you go back and that's, kind of where I got my feelings hurt were like you created a women's race series and you didn't consult any women racers before you did it. So it would be very interesting for me. I would love to talk to the other women racers, like say Anna or other ones that have been successful in the male series and see how they feel about it. I mean, obviously she's doing it, you know, there, I, there could be other motivations behind it, but I just have mixed feelings, but I've been around for a little while. And like, for someone like me, I've been around for a while and I'm established and I do I'm very successful for what I do. So I wouldn't be interested in doing a woman's series because for me, I feel like I'm going backwards, if that makes sense. However, I do believe for a lot of women that are trying to get sponsorship, that are trying to get that notoriety to take it to the next level, I could see that as being successful because I could see that as your start to get that spotlight on you. And then if you are smart, yeah, you can move past it and then take that momentum take that sponsorship and then compete in a more competitive regular class. If that makes mm-hmm. sense. I yeah. I would love to, I hope some of the women that are successful can do something like that. So. So you think that there's the potential for that to like help bring women into motorsport? Like there's a potential. I would hope so. I would think if they have the right people around them, because everything, I mean, a lot of racing has to do with sponsorship. You could be a good rider, but if you don't have the financial backing, you'll never be able to become successful. That's one of the things with our sport. So, but if women are intelligent, men men and women are smart and they can use that spotlight and they can use that from a marketing perspective to get and keep sponsors to grow their social media, they could use that to then their advantage to take it to a more competitive class. Mm -hmm. I could see that. I would like to see that, but sometimes you got to have really good people or experienced people around you that can help you do that. Cause if you're new at the sport, you also don't necessarily know how to do that. So right. um, my, my friend Mallory, that's in it. She said they are going to have marketing people that are going to help them. So I'm just really hoping that that's what becomes of it. Like maybe the top tier girls get an opportunity to go and compete elsewhere. That's what I'm hoping for. Do you think that there's like anything else that could be done to bring more women into motorsport? It's kind of hard because I mean, Definitely, I know 
I think a lot of European countries, there's other countries that do a lot better job of doing like the mini bike racing that they have. Like they have the Ovali cups or little bikes, you know, mm-hmm. to get just young riders in it. And I've been seeing where there's a lot more young women that are riding now that have started from the mini bike classes and up, up like starting since they were younger. And that's just to get younger riders in it. But like I said, now people treat their daughters just as they do their sons. So right. there's more girl, young girls doing stuff like that. It's kind of hard to just necessarily spotlight women because that's, you know, you also want the equality. So it's kind of like a double edged sword. Like, oh, I want to bring more women in. But how do I bring more women in to make it fair and competitive? So I definitely think like those mini bike series around and making them more friendly because I've seen the mini bike series in the U.S. gaining a lot of traction and a lot of younger women in them. And I think that's really cool. You know, I think it's just bringing young riders into the sport, like teaching girls at a young age that they're not different than a man, that they can compete with the boys. I think that's a mindset that you start teaching kids when they're younger and that they'll take that with them forever. Right. And they take that with them. It's a little bit harder as an adult to change an adult's mindset of something they've learned for 20 years of their life that they're equal, you know, it just, it's more difficult. So I definitely think, yeah, getting more of the youth involved, I think is more important. I do think, see women growing in the sport, even from 10 years ago to now. And I do think it'll continue to grow. And I hope when I'm a little old lady, I'm going to see a grid halfway full of women, you know, on a pro level, but I am, and I'm going to go around shaking their hands. I'm going to be on my little walker on the grid. Like, hey, ladies. (laughs) I did this once, you know, I, I do believe that it's coming and I do, I see it in the States and I see it overseas more and more women in it. And I think it's awesome. You know, I think so many people focus on, well, it's not equal. It's not level now, but we are getting there. We are better than we were 20 years ago. We are better than we were 50 years ago. You know, I have, I think you have to also focus on the progress and the progress. positivity side of it. Like so many people just focus on negativity. And I'm like, if you only focus on the negative, you don't see the positives and you got to see that. So even this FIM women's class is still a positive step to bring a spotlight to women. So I, you know, just spin it however you want to. <laughs> Can spin it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, great, to, great to have your opinion on it. Um, you've talked a little bit about sponsorship and I've got an interest in knowing because it's true how sponsorship seems to run this motorsport world. Um, you said your husband also rides and races. Um, it's really interesting for me on how do you find a sponsorship in your opinion versus the way of how he gets his is it harder for yourself to gain this or do you find that it's uh for people who are watching who are specifically for women what how are you finding this on your side it's actually significant easier for me to get sponsorship than it is for him to get sponsorship yeah so to be fair um probably eight years ago seven years ago something like that motul i've been with motul for about 10 years they flew all their athletes out and we had like this two day conference and they taught us a lot about social media and the importance of social media. And so, you know, I didn't know much about social media then they taught me everything I know, but understanding how social media is like your biggest bargaining chip to get sponsorship because it is advertising, it is marketing. So if you take a rider, my husband is a phenomenal fourth generation motorcycle racer, been on a pro podium everywhere he goes. He's disgustingly talented, you know, but you know, he'll win a Moto America race and I'll get more sponsorship than him because I have a marketing advantage compared to what he does. And so I learned years ago, the power of social media and I, I put a lot of work and effort into it. So you can win a race, but if you only have 10,000 followers versus someone that has $250,000, about, excuse me, 250,000 followers, a company is going to sponsor the person that has more followers because that's more views for their customer base, if that makes sense. So I actually learned a lot more about sponsorship and I got him back into it. And a lot of the people that were sponsoring me, I was trying to sell it as a package deal. Like, oh, if you sponsor me, can you sponsor my husband type of thing? You know, we're a package deal. We do a lot together. We do a lot of cool adventures and other stuff, which makes for great content. And a lot of them were kind of hesitant at first. And it took like a year or two for me to start getting him in and getting him more sponsorship. And I started teaching him about social media and he started understanding that it's not just about winning a race anymore, just the world that we live in. Everybody's on TikTok and Instagram and everything else. And so there's been a lot of avenues that have opened up and he's learned the importance of it and understanding it. And so, you know, I'm, I try to teach those around me to understand it. I think some of the older writers that have been around for a long time still don't understand it, but definitely some of the younger writers I see, understand the importance of the marketing and media because that is what gets you sponsorship dollars and if you don't have sponsorship you're not racing 
just the world we for live sure. in. You know, you whether you're paying to ride for a team through your sponsor's money or you're trying to do it on your own, you need that money. Racing it can get very, very expensive. And the more money you have, the more opportunities you have. And that's what it comes down to. But I think women definitely have a marketing advantage because I know statistically in the U S like the women's market is growing at an incredible rate. And there's like 60% more women than men. And that's a big market that pretty much every single motorcycle industry is trying to break into and to grow because there's been men and there's been around, but they've tapped a lot of it. And, but the women's market has potential to grow. So being a woman and there's not as many of the women out there that they can get like on a professional level to market, to engage, to get more women customers. So for me, it's been slightly easier once I grew my social media and understood that than it is, you know, for him, I pick on him. He's just another guy. Like you don't necessarily stand out, but um, I think women actually have a competitive advantage if you know how to use and harness that marketing to get more sponsorship money, if that makes sense, because there's less of us that you stand out more. Good answer. It's good to hear that. And it gives a lot of hope. At least there's some advantage. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, I've seen there's some people that are really good at social media and they can hype themselves up, but then you look at their race results and they don't have any real race results. Those type of people will fade. I do think that you need, you still need a, a mix of both. You still need to be smart on a marketing perspective, but you still need to start putting down some legitimate results to get the respect both within and without the industry. So I don't want anyone thinking all you have to do is grow your social media and you're going to get money. Like you still have to go well and you still have to commit, but it does make it easier once you have that sponsorship dollars. Super. Um, would be really cool to know a little bit more about your track days and what you get up to for training. We've seen that you do a lot on Instagram with your flat track in and you're on the, on the track often. Um, what's, what's, a, what's a year for you? Give us an idea of what your kind of year goes like. Well, so I live in the mountains, which get really cold. So there's not too much training. I have to leave to go and train, which is why Colin Edwards, the Texas Tornado, my husband's a coach there. And we go down there and ride a lot, which is where you see the TT and flat track style mini bikes. Nice. So we quite enjoy that. Or um, the team that we race for is based out of Long Beach, California. And for all of America, it's pretty much Florida or Southern yeah, California where you can go and ride. Yeah, all yeah. year. So we'll go out there and um, I coach track days, but we'll also train and test ourselves and stuff. But I don't get a ride as much as some of the other riders do in the winter. So what I do is I focus a lot more on my physical fitness and training, watching old videos, watching race recaps, you know, kind of not everyone gets to do that, but it's more of a mental state of mind that I start training on. I start working on my flexibility, my mobility. I get to do a lot of that because when you go back to back races, some of our races are back to back or, you know, you might have 10 days in between or whatever. If you're not already physically fit, you start to get really, really drained and worn out, you know, mm -hmm. physically and emotionally and mentally, you know, all of it. So I really take that time where we have the longer gaps in between, or maybe we only test once a month or so, you know, I really take that as an advantage to work on all that. I go to the chiropractor a lot and try to get all those kinks worked out and, you know, any of the physios start, like you might have a shoulder that starts hurting throughout the year, but you're not going to take care of it until the race year is over, you know? So on our off season, we really take the time to take care of our bodies as much as we can, you know, and train as much as we can take care of your body. And then once race, race season starts for us in America, it's just so go, 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 you know, and I also try to compete overseas when there is a small gap in our schedule. So we really don't get any break. Yes. Um, when you are on track and you are doing your training that you get to do, um, how's life in the pits? Are you mechanicing yourself or do you have help with this? And how do you feel confidence wise to work on your own bike? Yeah, I'm not much of a mechanic. I'll be really honest. So if you ask me to like change tires or brakes or oil or something like that, yes. But I have learned that the less I think, the faster I go. So <laughs> I like to have a phenomenal crew around me and that's obviously something you build trust with but a phenomenal you know tech mechanics i'm privileged to be on a pro level to race for a pro team so we have tons of guys that are there obviously i have my crew chief you know i have my suspension guy the people that i work with most my crew chief's phenomenal because i don't always know suspension lingo 
but I can say better or worse, more or less, you know, when he does something to the front, I can tell him like what it's doing and what I don't want it to do. I don't necessarily know. I need this many turns of compression and, and preload and dampen it. You know, I don't always know all that. And he laughs because he's used to working with it. He can understand how to pry the information out of me. Um, so I don't, I'm not super hands on, but I'm definitely, I would say particular. I understand what I want the bike to do and if it's not doing it and how I want more. And I, you know, I can communicate all of that with them. It's all about for me trusting and having a great crew around you. I think that's true. You see a lot of really good racers out there that are also their own mechanics, their own crew chief, and they come in and they just start yelling and telling people what to do. And they don't necessarily tell someone what it is doing. Cause they're, if your front end, maybe it's not going down quick enough the way you want, there's two or three ways you could do it. There's not just one solution, but some people just, I kind of get wrapped in their head. So then if they're out there riding, thinking about what they're mechanically going to do their bike, are they going as fast as they could? You know, are you, you're not then thinking about how fast you can go or how to push your markers. So that's why I always like to joke around the less you think, the faster you go. Some of the fastest racers I've ever met don't e couldn't even tell you what any of the parts are that you use on a motorcycle, you know? So for me, it's definitely just going out there doing laps. I always set a goal and the goal may not necessarily be a time, but we might try to run race distance. We're going to do the race distance amount of laps or I'm going to work on this turn and that turn. Or I'm going to work on my braking or I'm going to do this. Like every time I go out, I have a goal when I go out on the racetrack. Cause I say, if you don't have a goal, if you don't have a plan, I'm just wasting tires. I'm just wasting gas. What am I doing? Why am I here? So sometimes it's something simple. Usually when I go out first session of the day, it's like, okay, I'm going to do 10 laps. I'm going to shake off the cobwebs. I'm going to feel this, find my markers, do this, come in. What am I doing next? You know, and it could be just depending on how the bike's handling or what racetrack we're at, what we're going to do. There's sometimes there is a time, you know, and sometimes I'll get the faster rider or Jason Pridmore's my coach. He's phenomenal. And sometimes I might do that where we start racing each other, you know, because sometimes when you have a carrot to chase, you go so much faster, you know. So I always set a goal and I try to achieve that. But I definitely leave the wrenching to the guys that are professionals. <laughs> I will say it's nice to hear that somebody's got the confidence to say that, to admit that they may not have the technical uh, understanding, but can actually have the relationship with the mechanic or even understand the uh, the importance of having someone that you can work with on the racetrack. It's it's quite mind boggling and quite hard, I think, for people in confidence to uh, to go to the racetrack and deal with all of that on their own and to say that actually it's OK not to know everything and to say that you need help. That's great to hear from someone of your professional level. It's just I mean, really Absolutely. This is a team sport. I've said it. I remember the first AMA award I ever won and I got presented like at the AMA banquet. It's my first year pro and I couldn't even believe I won it, but I won. Um, it was called Sunoco go the distance award. It was for the rider that did the most laps for the whole year. And it was my first year. So I didn't know any of the racetracks. So I was the first one out and I did not come in unless I needed gas. So I won. And I just remember being in front of like all my heroes, all the superbike teams, like everybody there dressed nice for a banquet. And I couldn't believe it. And all I said, I remember I got up there and to this day, the people that were still around um, remind me of this, but I said, riders don't win championships, teams win championships. Riders get a lot of notoriety and they get a lot of the fame, but there's so much that goes behind it. Everything from all your mechanics, all your sponsors, the guy driving the truck to get your stuff around, a rider can't physically couldn't do everything that's involved with racing. And even if you try to, you have to go out there on the grid. Who's going to put your tire, your bike on the stand? Who's going to do this? You know? I think racing can be a selfish sport, but you have to understand that riders don't win championships, teams do. And I always try to give the credit, so much credit as I can to the mechanics because your mechanics are everything. Your mechanics not only set the bike up and they stress as much as you do. I think that's a more stressful job. I'd be worried about every nut and bolt being so tight. You know, that person's life is literally in your hands. You really have yeah. to have a good relationship, really have to have a good relationship with the person that's wrenching on your bike. I have to know my brakes are going to work. I have to know that all that's going to work. I can't second guess any of that or there's no point being there. And I've seen it happen before where you don't have that relationship. And I think more people need to let go of that ego and give it to those people and build that trust in the relationship. And, you know, not everybody's personalities fit. You know, you could find new people to work with, but it makes life easier. And I think it makes life better. But when you have that support system and even my mechanics, I call them my emotional support mechanics sometimes because when you're not having a good day and I'm getting nervous or they could tell, they know how to also talk to me like, hey, you got this. You can do it. Like sometimes I do need a pep talk. 
other times I need a kick in the butt where they're like, get out there, do what the book you know how to do, you know? So I joke around that building that relationship with them is a good understanding of who you are as a person and a racer and then also the bike. But riders don't win championships. Teams do. And I think I wish more riders would be give more credit to the guys that have grease under their fingernails and sweat on their brow and sunburn on their neck because those guys work hard. Oh, well said. Very well said. Um It'd be really cool to hear your opinion on our bikes. We know that you've ridden the Grahams before, and as we've even seen a post from you saying how you wanted one for Christmas. Um, yeah. We'd love, <laughs> we'd love to hear your, uh, your opinion on how you found the bike, and, and yeah, we've got the new model, and hopefully you'll get a spin on that at some point. But, oh, yeah, I've just... already been begging to ride that new one. You have no idea. <laughs> that yeah. was the most fun bike that I think I've ridden in so long. And so I got connected um, with Jensen Bueller here in the USA. I think he's Kramer USA. And yeah. he's known my husband for a long time, but hit me up too and gave us an opportunity to ride him. And I was like, yeah, I've never ridden one. I've heard great things about them, but they're not common. They're not like everywhere where you just have them or whatever. So I've never had the opportunity to ride one. And one, the first thing I was excited about was I could touch because I'm really short and I can't touch on everything. And I couldn't believe how lightweight it was. I was like, oh my gosh. Like I felt like I was almost on like a little twin bike or something <laughs> until you crack the throttle and you're like, this is not a little twin. You know what I mean? Like how fast it was. And it took me like a few sessions to get comfortable. And every session I'll get more and more comfortable because when I rode it last year, I was riding baggers, you know, like night and day complete difference. But every time I got on it, you, it was like trying to get a little kid to take away their toy. I was like, no, I want to <laughs> play with it more, you know, like. I, I mean, I never found the limit on that bike. I wish I had more opportunity to ride it and ride it. And poor Jensen, as soon as we stopped and I've just been like, what am I going to ride it? What am I going to race it? I've been blowing him up, you know? And obviously I think anyone that gets a ride one wants to ride it again. And so obviously there's like a wait list and time to get one. But yeah, I've been asking one for Santa Claus and my husband. I was like, I need them. And then he laughed because he's like, well, I want one too. <laughs> so I was like, oh, we got to get two. So we have spare parts and other stuff. But thoroughly thoroughly impressed with that bike i've told everyone about that bike how much i loved it because it just handled so good it was so lightweight and that's how they come like that's not like you get a bike you know now you get a bike and you got to dump dump twenty thirty thousand dollars into it to get suspension to get all the parts and electronics and make it like a race worthy bike those bikes come uncrated and they're ready to go and that to me like I said, I'm not a mechanic. So I was like, winner, because I don't want to have to, I don't know what parts to order. And then I got to pay someone to do it. So it comes ready to rip. And those things are so fast. And I just, yeah, and so lightweight. Like to me, it was extremely user friendly because any bike that's a little lightweight and easier to handle, you know, I feel like that's easier to learn on. But at the same time, even an advanced level rider, like my husband's even more advanced than me they're so powerful and they handle so well. It's like, you can't find the limit to those things. Like they want to go. And the faster I went, the faster she wanted to go. And I was like, man, I like her. I think girl, I'm sorry. Motorcycles are women. I call motorcycles women. So when you <laughs> see me refer to it as a her, cause I always tell people race bikes, they're beautiful, they're expensive. And if you don't ride them right, they'll hurt you. <laughs> so <laughs> I think, I think motorcycles are women. I definitely do. So I think she's amazing. We got along great and I've been dying to ride it again. Like I keep it. The last race I tried to ride it at uh, Barbara Vince's vest was huge, but there was already like six people in line to ride it. And I was like, man, I was so mad at Jensen, but uh, hopefully I'll get a chance to ride another one soon. Yeah. Maybe we'll see you at Barbara again this year. Maybe we'll have to make sure you get a spot if you're going to be there. Yeah, and I was even hitting him up. I was like, I go good at Barber. I have good race results at Barber. Come on, Jensen. Like, now you have the I, inside I, with the European crew too, so we'll be sure you get a spot. <laughs> yeah, I'll start name dropping and be like, excuse me, Finn said no, I what? could ride it this year. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. I, I definitely get on his nerves, but in a positive way. Yeah, fun. all fun. Well, I don't, do you have any more questions? Uh, you, you've been able to do everything I've asked you and uh, really appreciate your time for us. And uh, really nice to talk to you. So great time. to talk to you. And really, I mean, I think you're a total inspiration. And uh, I, you know, I have a young daughter too. And I, uh, she's just on, she's two. So she's just on like a little bike now, but she's cruising. And I'm like, all right, Finn, we got to take her to the dirt bike track. I want her to know, yeah. like, let's go. Cause she's so fearless. And then I hear, 
you know, talking to another woman like you, it's really just like how you said the dads kind of treat their treat their daughters like their sons and stuff. And that's kind of our vibe as well. And it's really it's just refreshing to know that it's it's out there. It's seen. It's like it's not weird. It's totally normal to like push yeah. these these sorts of things if if the kids are having fun with it. So absolutely um, just a real Even inspiration if- to talk to you. Oh, I love it. Even if she doesn't become a pro racer, you'll teach her that if she works just as hard as the men do, she can do anything. And that's what motorcycles teach women. You can do anything that they can. And I absolutely love the little girls that got there and kick little kids butt because I love it because little boys, they don't know how to handle their emotions. And like even (laughs) at the boot camp, the little 50 CC and 60 CC bikes, you see the little kids out there. And they throw the biggest temper tantrums, the little boys and the girls win. And it brings me so much joy in my heart. And I'm like, I love it. So I think that's rad. You're definitely doing it the right way. (laughs) Well, really, thank you so much for your time. I'm so excited. And um, like I said, we're going to start this series and we're going to be talking with a lot of women racers. We even have some handicap racers that we want to speak with. Like we got a whole, you know, people who we think could deserve a little more spotlight so i don't know maybe in the future like you said you would like to talk to other women about the fim cup and stuff so maybe that's a topic and if you'd be open to it to reach out and do another like a i don't know maybe a group round about people's opinions and stuff like that yeah absolutely keep me in your rolodex anything that promotes the women in the sports and everything you know, maybe we'll just have to get me a few more rides on a Kramer to bribe me. I think me that's to a totally done deal. You tell Jensen <laughs> Melissa said so, and he will do it. No problem. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Girl boss. Your boss said so. I like that's it. That's right. That's how it goes well, now. <laughs> awesome. Well, I appreciate it, guys. Yeah, and keep me posted when everything comes out so I can share it and stuff. Awesome. Oh, yeah, great. I'll, I will send you all that stuff, too. We'll do the collaboration, and everybody will see it, and we'll we'll figure out all that good stuff. Awesome. Well, thanks. Have a great day. I'll talk to you guys. Thanks so much for your time. Appreciate it. Have a great day. You're welcome. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.